there, and welcome to the Games Monster Podcast. My name is David Postansky, and once again, welcome if you have never listened to the Games Monster Podcast before, and welcome back if you have. Uh, On today's episode, we're going to be discussing the Nintendo 64. Just before we get into it, though, I'm going to remind everyone that this is part of the Extreme Improv Podcast Network, and by all means please 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 let your friends know we've had a great response to our recent uh, episodes about the Wii U the PlayStation and in particular the PlayStation 1 episodes that's why we're now going to do this Nintendo 64 edition so the Extreme Improv Podcast Network featuring the Games Monster Podcast the Super Kick Mania Pro Wrestling Podcast lots of comedy and improv podcasts uh, under the Extreme Improv banner and much much more So, we're going to get straight in to the Nintendo 64. I love doing these retro-themed episodes. So, the Nintendo 64, for those of you who do not know, or those of you like myself who just enjoys the nostalgia of reminiscing over fun video games, perhaps from our childhood, perhaps we're a little bit older, I can say that the Nintendo 64, as you may have noticed I have an English voice, came out here in 1997 it came out in 1996 i believe in japan and the united states but in the uk it didn't come out until i think march 1st 1997 and for me this was the first video games console that um like my family got like brand new for me i'd had a uh, super nintendo before this and you know we'd got it second hand it'd been out for a number of years and so what was great then is by the time you get it there's loads of games that have already come out and now you can get them second hand and cheaper and stuff like that but this was the first one where it's like right i need an n64 now i didn't get it day one and thank goodness i didn't for those of you who remember Uh, The Nintendo 64, I think, came out at £250 in England. And then within, I think, two months, suddenly it was £150. So they they had a massive drop in price because clearly it didn't do as well as Nintendo would like and it upset some people. But I got it for my birthday, which is in the beginning of June. And I got it with Super Mario 64. My gosh, I remember... When I saw Super Mario 64 on the demo stations of the N64 in like toy shops or or just wherever they had them, and it was in 3D, and I'd go and I'd play it for five minutes, ten minutes, as long as I could. If there was a queue of people lining up, and one of my vivid memories of that game was just that you'd go over to the paintings and they would ripple like water. And that was just incredible to me that they'd got these 3D graphics. I'd read about it in like Games Master, which, yeah, this is a magazine that came out in the UK. I'm not muddling that up. Might even still be out today. Don't really read games magazines as much. But there was Games Master, which, a bit of trivia for you, um, is a little bit the inspiration for Games Monster podcast um, for the title, because that did cross my mind. Um, but I'd read Games Master, I'd read about the Nintendo 64 and Super Mario 64, and it's this 3D platformer. Uh, my favourite uh, genre, especially at the time, was platformers. I loved the Donkey Kong Country games, I loved Super Mario Brothers, Super Mario World, etc. And just the idea that, wow, well, you can now get this in 3D, it's going to be so much better because there's a whole extra D. There's not just 1D, not just 2D, but it's 3D. And that was very, very exciting. And so I got it with Super Mario 64. And it was very expensive. The games at the time were about 50 or 60 pounds even. May have been 59.99. Um, and then later on they'd go down to about 39.99 for other games. Until I got Conker's Bad Fur Day right at the end of the N64. And that was suddenly 59.99 again. And I'll just tell that story whilst I'm on it now. When I got Conker's Bad Fur Day, uh, it came from the shop game. And clearly this pricing was insane for the time. So when I got it, not only did I get Conker's Bad Fur Day, but it came with a free copy of Quake 2 on the N64 and a third-party Nintendo 64 controller. So for some reason, they couldn't drop the price. That was the price was the price but they could sweeten the deal, and that's exactly what they did, and I absolutely uh, loved Game for doing that, because it made it worth it. Uh, It meant I got more games and an extra controller, 
which uh, was an okay controller, but we'll, 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 we'll get back to that later because I'm skipping right to the end of the story. Let's talk a little bit about the controller. The controller, wow. So the Nintendo 64 controller, people aren't very favorable to it nowadays, but I still really like this controller. It's a big controller and it fits well in your hand when you hold the n64 controller if you hold it either by the so just to describe it in fact it's got three prongs which is crazy because you obviously only have two hands um, but if you hold it like you'd hold most controllers by holding the left side and the right side it fits nicely in the hand but for most n64 games you would hold the middle um, prong and the right prong and so you'd be able to use the 3D stick which was in the middle of the console the console in the middle of the controller and it was this analog stick which really changed a lot of the way games were played and it's still on every um, main console to this day that when you get the controller I think the steam controller um, put it like some sort of touchpad instead of the left stick and it was crazy not a great controller in my opinion but perhaps I just haven't given it enough of a chance um, but um, it had one analog controller and now every one of them basically has two but it was just incredible this idea that you could just teeny teeny little like lean on the controller and suddenly your character would start tiptoeing and you'd press it more and they'd start to walk they'd press it more they'd start to um, run and you'd press it completely and they'd be sprinting and it's just this level of movement you could ch change directions really easily and it's it's not that other machines and other controllers d-pads or keyboard controls would allow you to do this because the best example of this is when you got super mario 64 on the nintendo ds um, trying to control it and you'd have to press a button to make Mario run and you'd find that you can't always go the exact diagonal direction you want it's it's a bit of a nightmare so anyway it also got the C buttons which is what basically predated these the right analog stick so whereas we use a right analog stick now to change the camera and the evidence for this is on the uh, GameCube, they actually called it the C stick for the camera stick, but the C buttons were the camera buttons. They were designed to be like, right, these are going to be what people use to control the camera in Mario and probably other things. Now, they were used for a variety of other purposes, um, but that was revolutionary and along uh, with the trigger button underneath the middle prong. So you'd use it instead of like a right shoulder button, sorry, a left shoulder button, and you'd use it like a trigger, so you'd use it to fire weapons and things like this. It was very, very clever stuff, very innovative. And it's amazing looking back now, and if you go to play an old game, all of the games were designed to work with this, but nowadays, if they've updated, especially first-person shooters like Perfect Dark, which we'll get to, or something like GoldenEye, or Quake, or Turok, or any of these things, you're like, oh my god, these controls are really confusing. Why can't I just play the... Um, with modern controls because they hadn't figured them out at the time but this is where they were starting to figure them out more so um, let's we've spoken a bit a little bit about the controller and again in the future I'll do an episode just about the different controllers so I think that's a fun topic um, but what else so the machine was still on cartridges and it was the thing in the press at the time in the magazines and on the internet not that I really um, had the internet back then that well the N64 is still on cartridges which makes the games more expensive which means that uh, publishers would rather be on PlayStation or Saturn because it's cheaper to put a game on a CD and obviously Nintendo were like well this is for anti-piracy and this is true even though people would have ROMs of N64 games and this was something which in the mid noughties I was like wow there are these N64 games and you can put them on PC uh, it took me several years to discover that that was a thing. Not that I've ever particularly played them. I know lots of people do. I'm not going to say anything super bad about it, but obviously it is piracy. Um, but I know that you could go to a car boot sale or a tabletop sale or something, and people would be selling pirated PS1 games. So this was obviously the benefit of cartridges on the N64. You couldn't get a pirate copy of a game and play it on the actual machine. <coughs> excuse me 
But the downside was that not only did people not put lots of games on there and the, uh, the games were more expensive on the N64, but lots and lots of uh, games couldn't be done on the N64. One of the games that came out towards the latter half of the N64's lifespan was Resident Evil 2. And Resident Evil 2 had been on two discs on the PS1. And that's a bit of an interesting story in itself because nowadays people said, yeah, it probably could have been in been on one disc or it was only fractionally needed to be on two discs. It was almost a complete duplicate of both uh, discs, just with slightly, slightly different content on each one. But still, the idea two CD game coming out on the N64 cartridge with compressed uh, CGI cutscenes, and I think may have been the only N64 game, or one of only a couple of N64 games that had CGI cutscenes in it. But every other multi-platform game, if on the PS1 it had CGI cutscenes or live-action cutscenes, then the N64 game just didn't. They either had to do them in engine, so you'd see like the character models that you'd control in the game doing the cutscene in its place, or they could have still images, but they couldn't have these fancy rendered cutscenes. So if, for example, Gex 3D on the PS1 and Gex 64, as they called it on the N64, um, they might put an extra level in the N64 one, which would be cool. But on the PS1, they'd have all these fancy cutscenes, extra sound bites that the characters could say, so there'd be more music. Um, and yeah, so there was differences in that sense. But um, let's just say about the other thing with the PlayStation, how it did in the console worlds, and also the Sega Saturn. The N64 came out, and everyone knows that the PlayStation came out in the same generation after all this business with the Nintendo PlayStation um, collaboration of the CD drive for the Super Nintendo didn't work out. So PlayStation became its own thing and then rivaled Nintendo. The Nintendo 64 came out significantly later than the PS1, maybe even a couple of years. And so they'd fully established themselves by the time the N64 came out and Nintendo went from leading with the Nintendo uh, Entertainment System and Super Nintendo to being in second place. Now it managed to um, overtake the Sega Saturn, who had been their nearest rival Sega had with the Mega Drive or the Genesis, but um, it just couldn't compare. They sold about 29, 30 million N64s compared to over 100 million or may have been 120 million um, PS1s. Its legacy though is an interesting thing just because I would say more of the top games on the N64 have a longer legacy in terms of being well respected and revered than some of the top PlayStation games. Now I did the top PlayStation games um, and went through a list of those in the most one of the most recent episodes a few days back. And of course you'll get things like Crash Bandicoots, which have had a second life through the re-releases, -re um, like the HD remasters. And there'll be the original Metal Gear Solid, which isn't as well received nowadays. Not that it's not well received, but because this from the sequel onwards they really changed up controls, then the gameplay of the original um, is seen as outdated quite quickly. We're about to get a remake of Final Fantasy VII, and obviously that was a big thing on the PS1. But when you think of the N64, and I'm going to go through a full list in a moment, and think of all of like the classic games, like the Legend of Zelda games on it, it's the Super Mario 64, Mario Kart, and then obviously Banjo-Kazooies and loads of the Rareware games, Goldeneye. Some of them are seen still in the conversation of best games or most beloved games ever. And that was something the N64 always had as its bragging rights, is that, well... Super Mario 64 is the best game ever, so even if there are more quantity on the PlayStation, there is more quality on the N64, because we have the best game ever in Super Mario 64. And then, like uh, just over a year later, it's like, well actually, we've got the best game ever in The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, and we still have the second best game ever. Then later on, and I'll get to this in a bit more detail, there was The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, which, even though it was sequel to Ocarina of Time, it generally isn't seen as a better game, 
but it's still up there in the conversation for, well, this is a fantastic game. It's almost as good as Ocarina of Time, so it has to therefore be one of the very best games ever. And even to this day, people say that these are some of the best games ever. Just like they say the original Super Mario Brothers game is still just as playable um, and a fairly perfect game. Super Mario 64, um, its sequels didn't necessarily top it, or if they topped it, only topped it in certain ways or certain people's opinions. Like Super Mario Sunshine on the GameCube, people don't think it topped Super Mario 64. Super Mario Galaxy, people really liked. I didn't like that one quite as much, but... So I definitely am someone that preferred Super Mario 64. But then I did really like Mario Galaxy 2. 3D World had its detractors, and Super Mario Odyssey, um, obviously, is seen as this incredible game. And it's the closest they've had to... And it's the interesting thing with the Switch in the current generation, because Zelda... Breath of the Wild, people say, oh, this is the this is the Zelda game. For the first time since uh, Ocarina of Time, and with Super Mario Odyssey, they're like, this is the Mario game for the first time since Mario 64, which just shows how great those games were in the late 1990s, that it's taken until the current generation for people to really say that something's replaced them. So anyway, the legacy of the console is pretty damn good. People have wanted an N64 Mini, just like we got a NES Mini and a Super Nintendo Mini, but the N64 Mini hasn't happened yet, and we haven't had an N64 Virtual Console on the Switch, or um, I forget what they even call it, where you get like the old games library. It shows how often I play the old NES and SNES games on there. But anyway, let's go through a list now. According to Metacritic, Critic, Metacritic of um, the best N64 games ever. I'll tell you which ones I had, and then like some a few quick sharp thoughts on each one as we go through. So as I mentioned, right at the top is The Legend of Zelda: Ocarina of Time, and this was an astoundingly good game at the time. I had played Legend of Zelda on the NES, and I couldn't really get into Zelda 2. And I know a lot of people see that as the black sheep of the family. I actually now really like that game, but I couldn't get into it at the time, and I had got Zelda on the Super Nintendo, but it was after getting into Ocarina of Time that I actually went back to the Super Nintendo game. Um, but it was just amazing, it, just the way that, I, I felt it was a bit weird that you couldn't jump in it, that Link would jump automatically at the edges of things that you could jump off of, because I was used to Mario and Banjo jumping about everything. Um, but these, the Z targeting, the Z targeting on it was fantastic as an innovation, which they still use today, where you target by pressing a button onto an object or onto a bad guy, and that way you'll just keep facing and fighting um, that villain. The puzzles, everyone remembers and hates the water temple puzzle, um, which is with the water temple in itself, because it was a puzzle of raising and lowering water, and I think they improved that on the remake on the 3DS um, and then just the story you know uh, you know, Ganon being that first version of like the human Ganon that we see in it and in the series that is and rescuing Princess Zelda and the fact that Link goes from being a child to being like teen Link or adult Link I suppose the time travel element, the fact that the ocarina, that the ocarina of time, what the hell is an ocarina? People only really know. I would say is, I would predict that over ninety percent of the people in the world who know what an ocarina is only know because of the Legend of Zelda, and I didn't know what an ocarina um, was, <coughs> and I've only ever seen them, and I've in relation to Zelda since and if I ever have seen one that's not to do with Zelda I've been like oh that's like in Zelda but I can't actually remember ever seeing one in the wild that wasn't linked to, <laughs> no pun intended linked to the Legend of Zelda but you could actually play it you could this was a fully playable instrument you could play several uh, different notes on this thing by pressing the controller in different ways to play the songs that you needed for various effects in the game 
But then you could manipulate uh, by pressing the control stick and buttons in combination or, or what have you. So you could just fully play this instrument on this video game. It was an incredible thing that they achieved that. Um, and then old link was, older link was cool. They should do a game with actual old link in. That would that would be cool. Um, and it was just an incredibly amazing rich world, the Hyrule field that you would run around, very tiny compared to almost every more open world game nowadays. Um, and I think they called the new Zelda game Open Air or something like that. It's just Nintendo being different for the sake of being different, but whatever. Um, but you felt like you could just explore and there'd be things happening and there'd be things happening at different times because it would go from day to night. It was just like you actually f could feel like you could get lost in that world at the time. Which I know people still experience with video games and probably find it a bit peculiar if they hadn't played this Zelda to go back to this one and think, really, you had that feeling about that? But it's just you have to understand nothing existed like it at the time. Okay, moving on. Next on Metacritic is Perfect Dark. Now, I played and completed Perfect Dark, but for me this was... This was from a time period where Rareware um, started to go downhill. So they'd had a lot of games come out, and then they put out successors, even if they weren't direct sequels, that were slightly worse. And I will just justify this quickly. So obviously Perfect Dark is a spiritual sequel to Goldeneye. And even though the graphics are better, I didn't get into the characters, the storyline, or the gameplay as much as I had Goldeneye. Uh, maybe that's because it didn't have the James Bond thing, perhaps I wasn't as into the futuristic alien aspect of it, but I didn't feel it was as good a game as Goldeneye. Then Banjo-Tooie went so huge compared to Banjo-Kazooie that to this day I still have never completed it. So um, I've got quite a long way into it on the Xbox re-release, but at the time I was just not as into it as I had been with Banjo-Kazooie. And then Mickey Speedway USA was just nowhere near as good as Diddy Kong Racing. So it was an interesting time period for Rare. And then Conquer came out and Conquer was great. But a lot of their follow-up games to things that had come out previously. And even Jet Force Gemini, which wasn't a sequel, um, kind of missed the mark for me. So it was an interesting time for Rareware. Next uh, on the list, did you know what? Did I even speak about Perfect Dark in particular? If, I don't really remember tons about it just because um, I completed it but I don't. I couldn't swear that I completed it all the way through on Perfect Agent because you'd get three difficulty levels Agent, Secret Agent and Perfect Agent which was kind of its lame equivalent to Agent, Secret Agent and Double O Agent from GoldenEye and apparently Nintendo had the opportunity to do a follow up um, James Bond game and Rare said no and I would be furious if I was Nintendo over that. I would have done everything I can to buy the James Bond license because it would have been still so valuable to this day. But anyway, next on the list is the aforementioned GoldenEye 007. This was a fantastic game when it first came out. It's made first-person shooters different because whereas games like Doom would come out and you just run through and blast everything and there are constant monsters, this was like Metal Gear Solid, but it came out before Metal Gear Solid. Not by very long, but it still predated it. Where um, you have to use stealth and sneak around and use gadgets and things that just made it a very, uh, very different kind of game for a first-person shooter. You'd get different equipment and gadgets like James Bond actually would have. It expanded uh, on the story on GoldenEye, and it was actually probably a better telling of the story than the actual film of GoldenEye, so that's cool. And then years later when they did a remake or a reimagining, they didn't have Pierce Brosnan in it and it had Daniel Craig, it was nowhere near as good. Next on the list is Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Now, again, sort of following, perhaps it's just a time period and I shouldn't have isolated Rareware as a thought about it, but when, uh, when you think about what I just said of Res follow-ups not being as good. Majora's Mask, as I mentioned earlier, in my opinion, wasn't better than Ocarina of Time. The graphics were a little bit better because it used it had to, in fact, use the expansion pack, which was extra RAM that you'd put in the front of the N64. You'd take out the jumper pack, which 
might have been one megabyte and then you boosted it up to four megabytes or maybe it was from four to eight I can't remember and the thing I didn't like about Majora's Mask is exactly what I just referenced about Ocarina of Time you could get lost in the world of Ocarina of Time on Majora's Mask the plot of the game is that the moon has a big face that isn't the plot but it's true it does have a big face and it's going to come hurtling into the earth in um, three days time and I think each day is either 12 or 24 minutes long and it means that you can't just hang out you're constantly in a rush and then the the time runs out and you're going to die and then it resets time like Groundhog Day now that Groundhog Day would be a perfect I don't know if there's ever been a game I don't, there might be a game of Groundhog Day, in fact, which is like some cheap and nasty looking game that's been shown in the last year and a half or two. Um, which I'm not sure if it's even out yet. I need to look that up after I've done this podcast. But it would be a great concept for a game, and I'm not sure there as it ever has been another game where time repeats like this on a loop. But you learn characters' movements, you collect items which you get to take back in time with you, and then you open up... Uh, new areas that you can get to with the new items and then you can get a little bit further and then you go back and repeat it again and because you've met new characters you've learnt secrets about them and things about their routine and then you can go back and get a little bit further but you couldn't just take your time with it there was always this sense of rush and then later on again using the ocarina you could do things that would slow time down and speed time up and, and whatever but that aspect really took things took it away for, for me and then you'd have the different masks now I think Majora's mask when you had it um, was just what you'd get at the end because the bad guy of the game was Skull Kid which is a very cool villain for the game he's got this scary looking mask he's called Skull Kid um, and it's in place of Ganon and I wish they'd do another Zelda game with either a new and original uh, villain or bring back Skull Kid that would be cool but uh, as of yet, they haven't done that. Um, and then, and what else? You get the different masks of the Goron mask, the Zora mask, and the... Oh my gosh, I forget the names. Something that makes you like the little... The Deku mask. Gosh, that would have been embarrassing if I'd completely forgot it. And you put on these masks and you become a version of Link that is now a different species. So you'd either be a Goron, a Deku, or a Zora. A Zora could um, swim and go underwater and reach new areas that you couldn't get before. A Goron could go up Death Mountain and uh, turn into a boulder and smash through things. And a Deku scrub. Deku scrub, not just a Deku. There you go, it's coming back to me. Um, Could shoot pellets and be smaller and get into nooks and crannies and things like that. It's, it's very much the routine of the Zelda games that you can only do this if you're young Link, you can only do this if you're old Link, you can only do this if you're in the light world, you can only do this if you're in dark world on like a Link to the Past or whatever. Um, and this had the three different masks where you can only do this if you do this, which at the time I suppose was closer to the three different caps that you'd get as Mario, which would make it so you could fly or be Metal Mario or Invisible Mario. Or like walk through the walls Mario, I should say, rather than Invisible Mario. Um, and loads and loads of games use that principle at the time. But it was very good, but it took me quite a few months to actually get through it because I'd get frustrated with it. Next on the list, Super Mario 64. Revolutionised uh, video games forever. Changed the camera uh, with the C buttons. Go anywhere, you know, go into a level and you'd be given specific goals and then Banjo-Kazooie and all these other platforms since have in some way um, taken inspiration by Mario 64. You could pick up bad guys and throw them, you'd spin around uh, Bowser by his tail. And the controls, they got them right first time. There may have been the 3D platformer um, Jumping Flash, which I don't think I ever played, and Bubsy 3D. But even when you go back and play... Like the original Tomb Raider, the controls are so... Like the camera swings around to follow you and you have to press a button to make it so you can walk and then another one so you run and stuff like this and everything was complicated. But Super Mario 64 got it right and to this day you could pick up Super Mario Odyssey and feel right at home with the controls where you do like the butt slam 
Uh, you do a triple jump by timing your jumps, wall kicks, and all these kind of things. And they all originated on Super Mario 64. Paper Mario, I got it um, eventually when I got it on the Wii uh, Virtual Console. Didn't get much time at the time to play it then, but never played it on the original N64. But I know lots of people love it, and they're even more um, fond of the sequel on the GameCube, but I can't comment too much on that. Banjo-Kazooie, at the time when it came out, I was like, this is better than Mario 64. And if you catch me in the right mood, I might say that again, but generally I probably won't. But um, Banjo-Kazooie is a brilliant game. It's got all of that rareware humour when it was at its absolute peak, following on from the Donkey Kong Country games. Real, you know, Realistically, Banjo-Kazooie should have been Donkey Kong Country 4, and it would have Donkey Kong would have been bigger for it, uh, a bigger franchise. But they did something different, slightly off to the side, did it as a different character, called him Banjo instead of Donkey Kong. But you can see that their big furry character, similar um, in appearance, just looks like furry arms, muscly arms, upright, um, and then like the flesh-coloured muzzle and the similar eyes. It was basically just Donkey Kong, but they, they called it something else. Uh, and yeah, it was it was a great game. Nine le nine levels, nine worlds. Very much in the model of Mario sixty four, where each world, instead of having a certain number of stars, would have a certain number of jiggies for you to collect. Um, okay, let's move on from that. Love Banjo Kazooie. Wave Race. Have it. Tried to play it over and over again at various points throughout the time I had the N sixty four. Of I must try and complete Wave Race, and I never could could only complete the first level or two and then after that I would you know not win didn't enjoy it for that reason Conker's Bad Fur Day uh, love this game love the humor in it it's incredibly short and I feel that because they put all the voice acting and uh, worked on all the cutscenes that they perhaps didn't have enough space because I know it was a big cartridge for the time to just put in uh, more levels but the humor of it is still one of the funniest games I've ever ever played and I so dearly wish that they'd do a proper sequel on the Xbox not like they did the remake which was actually worse of Conquer Live and Reloaded uh, where they censored it changed up some controls and then put all of their energy into a multiplayer game that no one cared about but I wish they'd actually done what at the time was rumoured to be the sequel called Conquer uh, Grabbed by the Ghoulies and even though Grabbed by the Ghoulies became an Xbox uh, original game um, on the original Xbox, rather, um, which was basically the rareware ripoff of Luigi's Mansion. The title of it, the slightly risque title, sounds like it should have been the Conquer sequel. Conquer, grabbed by the ghoulies. But then they've said that it was Conquer's other bad fur day, or Conquer's other bad day, or some just lame title. So I don't know if grabbed by the ghoulies was ever a subtitle for the sequel to Conquer, but I wish they would do a sequel to Conquer, even 20 years later. Next on the list is Mario Tennis. I liked it a lot. Don't think I ever quite completed it. I was near as damn it completed it, though. Maybe I did complete it, because I might be muddling it up in my head with the next game on the list, Mario Golf. So both these Mario sports titles were very easy to pick and play, and because of the Mario license, got my interest, because otherwise I wasn't really interested in playing a tennis or sports or golf game at the time. Loved Virtue Tennis on the Dreamcast, so... If it was something that's got a lot of hype about it, I would play it. But they were good games. Next is Rayman 2 The Great Escape. A platform game where everyone's like, oh, Rayman is back and it's amazing in 3D. I think I had this on the Dreamcast. And I, I got so far in it, but then it didn't, didn't hook me enough to actually see it through. Donkey Kong 64. Now, here's the thing that's frustrating. I've got this for the Wii U when they eventually finally re-released it because it didn't come out on the Wii. And the controls on it are so bad on the on the Wii, on sorry, on the Wii U, that I think there's something wrong with it. I heard that people may have said F Zero on the Wii U had like the controls messed up so it was oversensitive or whatever. Just trying to get a very early banana as Diddy Kong on the Wii U to walk across a tightrope was an almost impossible thing where it's just like the sensitivity where I'd try and make him just creep along and it wouldn't happen, then you'd press it too much and he'd suddenly fall off the edge of this tightrope. 
But I, I really liked the game at the time, and I don't know why, perhaps just in my old age, I'm not as good a player to be able to control Diddy Kong on like level 1 or 2. But um, I haven't been able to go back and play it again. I got all but one banana for the longest time, to the point I think this literally may have had me in tears. Just I still can't beat this one thing to 103% this game, or whatever you would do, or 104%. And even though I, like, I've done everything else, I wanted to get if there was like a true ending. It was just such a pain to do. And I understand now why people say this kind of killed off the collectathon, as people called it. Because from Banjo Kazooie, upping the ante on Mario 64, to um, Donkey Kong 64, upping the ante on Banjo Kazooie, and then eventually um, Banjo Kazooie upping the ante again, this, this just went to ridiculous lengths of you play as five different Kongs whereas on all of the previous Donkey Kong Country games you'd only play as two but this time you'd have to play as all five at one point or another they weren't interchangeable where there would just be tiny bits that you couldn't do like on Donkey Kong Country 2 there'd be certain things that only Dixie could do or certain bits that only Diddy uh, could do but this meant there was five different characters that you had to bounce between um which was crazy. Um, but anyway, let's let's move on to the next one. We all remember the Donkey Kong rap. Uh, put your hands together. Oh, well, how's it goes? DK. Donkey Kong. DK. Donkey Kong is here. He is back again and about time too. Do you know, I'm actually quite a good rapper, but that wasn't good because the original uh, rap is... Just one second... Sorry about that. There was a sudden shout in the background. I uh, just had to make sure that no one was dying. Hopefully you didn't shout, hear me shout and respond. So we're just going to um, continue on on our list because we've only got a very few moments left of this podcast. And it says Blast Corps. Now, if you just read this, you might read it as Blast Corpse. And Blast Corpse is not the right pronunciation. It's Blast Corps. And Blast Call was a great idea for a game, and I don't know why there's not been more games like it, or perhaps even any other game like it. The idea is that there's a truck, I think, that's gone out of control, and it's got like this nuclear device on it. And if it crashes into anything, it's going to blow up America, or blow up the world, or whatever. And then using a variety of different vehicles, or giant robots, or whatever, you would have to smash everything out of its path so that this thing could just keep going it's kind of ridiculous because what they would just do and this is this actually solves the whole problem of blast core instantly now is you just get like a big thing that it can drive onto so you just get like a big ramp so that this nuclear bomb can just drive onto um onto this the back of this other vehicle um onto this big ramp onto the back of the other vehicle you'd make it so that you immobilize the tires so that it's not going anywhere and then you just fly this thing out of there. Doesn't that make sense? Um, but maybe there's some logic for why that couldn't happen on the game. Anyway, let's let's move on to the next game. Then it says Banjo Tui, I've spoken about just about enough. Beetle Racing Beetle Adventure Racing. I never played that. Then Resident Evil 2, which I've spoken about I'm sure on other podcasts. It's one of my favourite games of all time. It's great on the N64. One thing I didn't like is that they would try to do exclusive features for certain games, for certain editions of games, when they would come out on the N64. And then, because I love Resident Evil 2 so much, I would think, I've got to get that just to have this. And the exclusive features were that it got a item randomizer, which would mean that when you play it again, the items are in different places. And to be honest, I may have done that once, but... I'd feel frustrated because it'd be like basically the same game but now I just don't know where to go and it's like well now it's just confusing because when you learn something you don't want it to necessarily just be random and so you're running around because the running around part didn't make you feel good learning it and learning to feel in control of it helped you feel uh, made you feel good about the game but I suppose some people might have really liked that um, it also got like a blood colour changer 
filter thing so you could have green or blue blood I don't care about that Nintendo at the time had a thing about games not being too violent or showing blood but that wasn't a good uh, feature to me and then it got the X-Files that isn't the X-Files theme but it's what I was going for and you probably got that idea um, where it was linking things into other games in the series so probably mentioning things that related to Resident Evil 3 Nemesis and also linking things into Resident Evil Zero, mentioning Billy Cohen. Interesting bit of trivia for you, they spelt Cohen incorrectly. Um, also though, uh, Resident Evil Zero was going to be an N64 game, but got cancelled. We'll do an episode of the podcast about that one day, I'm sure. Next, there's WWF No Mercy, everyone's favourite pro wrestling game ever. Either that or WrestleFest, the arcade game. And shout out to Retro, uh, Retro Mania Wrestling, the spiritual sequel. I'm going to do an episode on that in the future because I'm very excited about that game. And anyway, so WWF No Mercy, it was the chain of games that led up to this was there was WCW uh, versus The World, which may have been a... Re- and all of these games may have been a reskin of just like a Japanese exclusive Uh, wrestling game and so you'd get some Japanese wrestlers on them but there was WCW versus the world and that was on the PS1 and it was a good game didn't have the greatest graphics ever quite blocky and all of these games including No Mercy were quite blocky when compared to something like WWF Attitude which to me looked photorealistic at the time but whatever Um, and then there was WCW vs NWO World Tour which uh, came out on the N64 which was the equivalent to WCW vs The World but this time for the N64 which was followed up by WCW slash NWO Revenge also on the N64 which was a great game, I love that WCW game but then all of the licenses and I'll do a show about this either on this or on this podcast, the Games Monster podcast, or on the um, Super Kick Mania Pro Wrestling podcast, or on both. Maybe I can put the same episode on both as a cross promotion thing. Just thinking out loud. So after this, all of the licenses of the wrestling companies and the video game developers and publishers swapped around, which was a very interesting time. But it meant that the people that had made WCW versus the World were now making the WWF games, and they made WWF WrestleMania 2000, which was a good game, as a good sequel to the WCW game, but to me was an inferior WWF game than WWF Attitude. And then they upped the ante with WWF uh, No Mercy, which was a good game, and I played it a lot, but I don't think I played the story mode all the way through, because um, just one life getting in the way, and two... I wasn't as into um, the this style of game compared to WWF Attitude and Warzone games. Okay, let's just have a quick, quick look, see what's coming up. There's loads coming up. In fact, I am, I'm going to make the executive decision right here that we are going to do a part two about the N64 because it's perhaps my favourite console of all time. So anyway, we've just about a minute left of recording time on this show, and I can promise you in the future we will do longer episodes, but just so I'm getting into this podcasting business, um, we've got a slight limitation for 45-minute episodes, which I don't mind for now, but we, I'm certain that this is going well enough, thanks to all of you guys and all the support out there, that we will do bigger and longer ones. So the um, Games Monster podcast, once again, available on iTunes, on Alexa and Spotify and Google Podcasts and all that, please let your friends and family know. The more subscribes and likes and shares and stuff like this that we get, the more that this will become a bigger thing that I can keep going and giving you my... Because I enjoy giving my video game trivia and knowledge and opinions so much. I I absolutely love talking about video games. Could do it all day. I want to hear what your favourite N64 games were. Uh, Do you like or disagree or... Um, whatever with anything I've said, let me know. Tweet me. There's the Games Monster Twitter, so just look up Games Monster. I can't remember if it, it's, the actual handle is Games Monster or just Games Monster Pod or what have you. I'm going to tell you right now. I've got my iPhone out. I've got 30 seconds left to go on this. So yeah, it's at Games Monster Pod. I'll make sure I know that for future. And this podcast will also be on our uh, Extreme Improv. YouTube channel and Facebook page so you'll be able to see it from there Um, and it'll be a video but you'll just hear the audio of it but we have lots of other podcasts that are videos as well but for now 
My name is David Pstansky, and this is the Games Monster Podcast. Bye, Ziz.